Hello, I'm Nathan Stuck from Whisper uh, and Whisper University. And uh, this year we're talking to some key people in the industry. And today uh, we have Michael Vinning. We talked about that, right? Did I pronounce that right? Did I get it Pretty right? Close. Pretty close. Yeah, my, my wife being from South Africa, she she did, pronounces her V's and her W's and her R's, rolls That's them and right. everything. But I'm horrible with names, so uh, I, 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 can't, I can't read the names in my life. Michael. How's about that? Yeah, Michael. Very good. Michael uh, from Calix. He's the president and C, uh, COO, and I'm, I'm happy to have him on, on the show today. And so, Michael, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Do your your elevator pitch intro. Sure. Uh, well, as you mentioned, I'm, my name is Michael. I'm from uh, Calix. I'm the president and COO at Calix. We um, have built out a software and cloud platform that allows companies to deploy really simple access networks. And then on the premises side, we've allowed them to, to build out, again, with our cloud and software platforms, the ability to deploy and excite their subscribers. And both of those come together with the, with the best networks in the, uh, in the market, the best go to op, uh, market opportunities, and then the ability to grow your businesses. So, and that's, I've been with Calix now for five years. Uh, prior to that, my history is, I was with Salesforce for four years. I did a stint in Asia, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, running okay. customer success, then, uh, and then I ran the customer success for small, medium business for Salesforce globally, which was about two hundred thousand customers and roughly a three and a half billion dollar business. Prior to that, I ran a uh, billion dollar business for um, Bell Canada, um, and then prior to that, I was with Microsoft for ten years, uh, doing different uh, jobs in Europe and in Canada, uh, running primarily in telecommunications. So that's kind of wow. my history. Yeah. yeah. So are so, you originally from the U.S. Um, or and you just ended up being abroad, or, or no? Where I'm are a, you from abroad? I'm a Canadian. So Canadian, okay. Yeah, so okay. I'm a Canadian, and I'm 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 uh, I'm a mixed Canadian. So I'm, I'm from the East Coast. I, I was born in Ontario. My parents are immigrants from Holland, so they came in in the '50s after World War II, um, and then we I spent my formative years actually in Alberta, which is if you know Canada, that's. Uh, that's our Texas. Um, and so I grew up in the, I grew up, you know, and I, I, you know, to the point on wisps and all those things, I grew up in a very small town uh, called Brooks, Alberta, which was 9,000 people, oil and farming town. All my family is, uh, you know, farmers and those kind of things. And so, yeah, that's, I'm a, I'm a Canadian and international was, um, you know, the story of international, I'll take, I'll digress for 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, it is all my wife. So, okay. Okay. Uh, so my wife, uh, you're American, so you know. Have you ever heard of Up with People? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so my wife, after high school, took a year off, saved all her money, and then she joined uh -huh. Up with People and traveled the world. Oh um, wow! Okay. Yeah, and so she did that as you know one of those uh, one of those troops. And um, I was a rather boring person, had never traveled, and and was living in Canada. And and uh, it was in around 2005, and we're sitting in our backyard. And my wife looked at me and she said, "Is this it?" And I said, "What do you mean?" Um, is this it? I said, well, this is pretty great. We got two beautiful yeah. children. We have a nice big backyard. We have a pool, all that kind of stuff. This is pretty great. What are you thinking? And she goes, well, is this it? And then we're going to die. And I said, well, you're clearly thinking about something. So, <laughs> right. so, yeah. so what are you thinking? And then that's when she said, uh, I really think we should go international and have an international experience with our family. And so um, took me a little bit to wrap my head around it. And then a little over two and a half years to make it happen with Microsoft. And then I was transferred to, you know, I pursued opportunities internationally, went to London and that was my first, uh, my first international stint. It was fantastic. Wow. That's awesome. You know, my, my wife is from South Africa, so um, I met her in the U S here, but I go back to visit and I, I don't know if it's a U.S. mentality, uh, but like the thought of leaving the U S and having international, it, it, not a lot of people do it. Right. Whereas Correct. like when I go to South Africa, you hear like, Oh yeah, yeah, I had a job in London. I had a job in Australia. And then I had a stint in New Zealand. And it, it seems just much more natural for people in other countries to, to work in other countries, but, but not in the U S we, we tend to say, well, I, I live in the U S and that's where I am. So that, I, that's cool that yeah. you were able to do that. I, I would say that's that's North America. So I'd say U.S. and Canada are pretty much exactly okay. the same in that regard. Most people, a, a very tiny percentage of people actually go abroad and and work or or live. Um, and I, I think part of that is you know we got a big ocean between us, all those things. Whereas if you're you know if you're part of the EU or you're living in the UK, you hear that a lot in the UK, where people are like, oh, I went and I worked in Spain and I went in Portugal. Well, 
when it's a you know five hour drive through the channel, it's it's not nearly as as scary as you know lifting up my family and and leaving mm. a client, right? It's it's a lot more complex. So you're right. Well, here here in the U.S., you can drive nine hours and still be in the same cornfield in Kansas. So exactly. <laughs> it's a little different. I, I love traveling in South Africa where I can go from the the beach. To, to the mountains, to the plains, to the steppe. And it's like, wait a minute, that was a five hour drive and right. not in the US, I guess. Then disadvantages of having a large country. Well, yeah, when it's 4,000 kilometers or whatever it is in miles, you know, wide, it's a, it's a very different, it's a very different mindset, right? Right, absolutely. So how did you get into sales? Did you, did you come out of college? Like I'm a salesperson, did you do sales stuff before or what kind of drove yeah. you kind of in that direction? Well, that's where I first started. So uh, I definitely started on the on the sales side, and, and it was in university. Uh, I worked at a actually I worked at a, a I lived in a, a little blue collar town, and I happened to work. I got a job at the uh, local menswear store, which was very high end. Okay. Actually, had the highest. You know, I was just asked this question the other day. It had the highest per square foot sales of any menswear store in North America, and it was wow. a little. And it was a little GM town in the middle of no, like, you know, a little blue collar town. And uh -huh. the only big industry there was General Motors. And um, and that's where I learned how to sell. And it was amazing. They had this all these salespeople who were really talented. And then they had a leader who was actually all about data and analytics. I remember sitting there and watching him and saying how he would actually this is back in the you know late 80s early 90s and he would have these printouts where he went skew by skew and determined trajectories of products and all those different elements so it's where yeah. i also learned about bi and analytics and that's where i started my career and then over time um i i actively pursued other opportunities you saw international but also mm -hmm. i took on operational roles and all those other elements so that i could actually learn the entire an entire company and how a business runs um, mm -hmm. Which gives me the flexibility of you know you know leading the entire team, which is what I currently do. Right? Yeah, yeah, and I you know so I I don't have the sales background, although I've been told I can sell iced Eskimos. So I, I think it's because I consider myself not a salesperson. I'm truly trying to figure out what's best for the customer. Right. Um, and, and but I when I elevated from the technology side, right I, into operations, it's like wow, I went from playing. Che checkers to playing chess because operations you've got so many pieces to move uh, how have you seen like like you've been at calyx now for five years what have you seen that you've been able to do now on that operation side that maybe you couldn't do on just the sales side when you were when you were focusing on sales well to your point it's it's definitely playing a game of chess right you have all these different assets and you're trying to bring the teams together to be successful and and i think you know, what we've done, uh, our company has actually gone through a massive transformation over the last 10 years, led by our CEO, Carl uh, Russo. And it's all, you know, I joined the company five years ago when we were primarily a hardware company and we've become mm -hmm. now a software and cloud company. And so, mm -hmm. you know, to your, your question around how do you see all the pieces coming together, you actually have to lead the entire organization through that change because it's not just one function. It's it's actually the the R and D organization is rethinking about what are the products that they build. So where they used to deeply integrate it and have complex systems, which is where we first started. Now what you're doing is a, you're abstracting all that to a platform right. and operating systems and clouds, and that requires a, a completely different talent pool. So we brought in all these new people, and you go through that transformation. For example, moving from a waterfall model to agile and massive cultural change. But then that flows through the entire organization because it changes, you know, how do you partner with regards to building hardware? How do you partner? You know, what are your sales teams going to do? Right. Your sales teams need to be reeducated that, you know, we don't just sell hardware. We're actually now engaging with the customer around business process where, you know, mm -hmm. before it was around build a fiber network. Now it's actually nathan let me sit down and understand how you run your call center well we have a support cloud and that hex allows you to run an end-to-end -end call center let's talk about what is your marketing team doing how are they using data and analytics to understand your subscribers so that you can grow your business and generate incremental revenue that is not something that you know someone who was selling a you know a fiber connection in the past would would be comfortable with so we'd have mm -hmm. we have to bring the whole end-to-end -to -end company together and run through that cultural transformation to help everybody understand where we're going, how the magnitude of the change, and then what do they need to do? What do they need to learn? And then support them through that learning journey so that they can step up and, and uh, meet the, the needs of our new customers and of our new business. 
Yeah, and I, I think you guys have done an awesome job. That I, I don't know if we're your longest um, customer that you guys had to to win over, right? I think like we did like a two year evaluation just because of where we were and what we were doing. And my background no, you're is you're definitely hard. You're definitely uh, a, a long one, no doubt. Hard, right, right. And because my background was software, I was beating you guys up on the software side. Really? And you're like, we're getting it. We've got this. We're we're we're. This is what we're doing. We're laying the foundation. And and, and a lot of companies tell you that but then you don't necessarily see it. And, and what I've seen is the it took you guys that a long amount of time to do that, that monumental shift. But now that you've done it, it's like, bang, now we can do it. We, we got the foundation, we spent the time. We didn't put a Band-Aid on it. We actually rebuilt the foundation and now we're, we're ready to go and we're, we're, we're moving way, way faster. Uh, so I was real excited to see that as you guys kind of went through that progression. Uh, well, and, and so to your point, like the hardest part of, I'd, I'd say, the transformation that we've gone through is that, you know, Carl really started this 10 years ago with the team and it's been a, it's a huge long journey. And the, but the mm -hmm. problem, you know, that to articulate to customers is that they don't see a lot of that value literally for eight years. They never saw the value of it because we're, right. we invested, you know, we've invested almost a billion dollars into our software and cloud platforms, which is a huge investment over time. And the customers are saying, well, wait, I got to run my business. What's your value <laughs> now? Right? Now, now, now. now. <laughs> I was saying, yeah, but we're building this, we're, we're completely building this unique. It's completely, there's no one else in the marketplace who's made this investment to build a fully abstracted operating system that covers not only your fiber network, but it reaches all the way into the prem. No one else has done that. And so the, that was our biggest problem is that we kept saying, yes, we're doing it and we're explaining it and we're explaining it, but they're like, right. show me the money, right? And, <laughs> you know, and, and this is, I'd say, one of the biggest business lessons that we all have to go through, which is, you know, if something's worthwhile, it's not easy. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you if you read things like the innovators dilemma and those types of um, you know books, they talk about, look, it's really hard when you're going to change a market and when you you're a visionary and you, you have to go somewhere. And so we're very fortunate because we're founder led. And that meant that our founder could ignore the, you know, ignore to some extent uh -huh. the pressures that would normally come for, you know, I want a faster return to make that really long investment. And, you know, he jokes, no one else would have been able to, to stay the course. Um, it's only because of the fact that he, you know, he had the support of the board and he's also a major shareholder that we were able to do that. And now we're in this very uh, strong position. In fact, we were just having this conversation over the last two days because we went through our full roadmap for the next two, uh, fourth uh, four quarters. And I'll just give you one example is that with our Giga Spires, we were the very first in the market with carrier class Wi-Fi 6. Um, mm -hmm. And it took us, but it took us three years, right? And, you know, everybody's saying, uh, well, I'm just going to stick with my, you know, do I want to go to Wi-Fi 5 or to Wi-Fi 6? And then initially we had to harden it. We had to get the platform ready. We had all kinds of work we had to do around use cases and expansion and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of frustration from customers, but they stuck with us through it. And, and so three years for one unit, well, this year we're releasing six different units, right? Mm -hmm. And so our ability to your point, now that the platform's in place, not only can we go faster on, on the Wi-Fi 6, it's mature, we're way ahead of our competition who's still, you know, they're bringing out Wi-Fi 6 next year. Um, but then the other part is that, and this I think where our biggest value is, is that we've actually built a platform that allows us to go and create an ecosystem around it so that small service providers who normally, you know, have the challenge of will someone pay attention to me so I can actually bring these solutions to market and excite mm -hmm. subscribers? We can now do that work in our platform and bring really premier brands like Arlo to market fully integrated so that the service provider doesn't have to do that work. And that really comes from my Bell heritage. And it's also something I learned at Salesforce that, you know, when I was at Bell, every time you go to integrate a new solution to bring a product to market with a customer, it would take right. 18 months. And at the end of it, you, you don't know whether or not it's going to be successful. Can I sell it? Will I make money on it? Right. And, right. and you just don't have the resources. So then you take that. So that's a big company. Now imagine you're a wisp or you're um, starting a new business. It, it's, it's really difficult for them to custom integrate that. So we believe that's our role. We're doing it very successfully. And now what they can do is they can bring it to market with, with zero risk. Mm. Right. right. Zero right. investment from, uh, you know, you don't have to go and do a ton of integration work, right? Because we've already yep. done it all. 
And now you launch it. And then the best part of it is, and this is what I learned from Salesforce is, you know, you have a customer success organization and say, here's the best practices. Mm -hmm. Here's how you sell it. Here's how you make money. Don't sell, you know, don't market it this way because it won't sell well, all that kind of stuff. Right. And so, yeah. So that ecosystem yeah. becomes really important and exciting. I think that's great. You know, so if you tie it to like to, to what WISP think about, you know, it's almost the difference between doing LTE and, and, a, and, a, and a proprietary system. LTE, I have to put in a million dollar core. I have to spend right. all this money before I sign up a single customer. Right. Whereas when I go with some of our pri proprietary ones, I just have to turn it on and it starts working work. and I can sign up a customer. And, and that's what you guys are solving. Mm -hmm. You're taking all that complexity and I may choose not to sell that product, but the other one you do, I may choose to do that. And that, that's I think that's really smart with that foundation. So you mentioned something that I, I want to kind of go back to because I want to tie this into business owners and WIS. You mentioned that, you know, it was really hard. It started 10 years ago and then you came in five years ago and it was really hard to, to shift the company culture. Yes. Um, to think more on the software side than the hardware side. You guys have been great hardware engineers for so long. But then you also mentioned that, you know, you had to ask your customers to, to stick with you and, right. and to hold on. And then one of the things we see as WISP is I have this legacy old equipment. Um, you know, I know I need to upgrade, but you know what? It, it I can't upgrade it all at once. How, and I have to have a plan. Like it's a three year plan or two year plan. Well, nobody wants to hear that their internet's going to be upgraded in three years. Um, right. And that's what you guys went through. Like, hey, it's coming, guys. It's coming. It's going to be better. Can you talk to a little bit of, on how you got that rep, the relationship with your customers? And what did you guys look at to, to have them stay around and wait, right? As other competitors are maybe leapfrogging you in certain areas, but you know, ultimately, you're going to have the best. What did you do with the customer side of things? Well, I, I think the first thing is, is that it's really important that you have a great customer relationship, right? And that's one of the benefits yep. that yep. with has is that, you know, you're in your local market, you're not one of these big incumbents who, you know, is a faceless company, right? Mm -hmm. And so by building that that deep relationship with your customer, they, they come to trust you and they know that you have their best interests in mind. And I think that's one of the big parts around which we see you know, our, our primary, our, a big part of our markets is is everything we're doing in the regional businesses, and and a lot of those those companies are all focused on their local community. Whether it's mm -hmm. giving back to you know the school and participating in the things that are going on in the town, you know, all those different elements, and that's really uh, part and parcel of what we do as a company, which is our customers know that we care, and so if you care, that comes through, and that that drives loyalty. Right. So someone can come in and offer a price and, you know, then they come and they go and they come and they go. And and our, our customer base is filled with people who got enticed by a lower price and then they went off. And then, I, you know, and then they came back because they said, yeah, it's not the same thing. So for us, one of the things that we've invested in is we invest in customer success. We have a, a where a lot of our competitors don't answer the phone. We always answer the phone. Right. We go above and beyond. And we've built that reputation. We're now 21 years in as a company where our customers know that we've got their back and we're going to be there for the long term. So I think that's the key thing is you got a message that we're here for the long term. We care about the community. We're not some faceless board where you're just calling into a, a call center and, and no one really cares about you. We care about you. And, and, it, and then the second part of it is that we are very transparent about what we were going to do and what we're not going to do and really asking for customer feedback. Right. Hmm. Um, and, you know, you know, we've we, we have a customer advisory board. We have multiple customer advisory boards. And now that we're in this amazing position where the platforms are going at a really fast pace, the, the toughest problem that we have is which thing do we do first? Because right. You know, and balancing out what the customers want, because now we can start turning this stuff out really fast, which is great. Um, and so we're trying to get lots of feedback and and not be delusional with regards to, hey, we think we're always right. We really need to balance that off with the customers. Sometimes the other part, too, is um, with customers, you guys say, yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but we got to go for the we got to go do the big thing. Right. And so, you know, yeah. communicating with the customers really transparently and actively on a regular basis while caring for them is really important. That's why we think that. Um, you know, being proactive with service is important, understanding what's, you know, understanding what's happening, trying to solve their problems, you know, and, and there's other ways, like we have lots of strategies with regards to retention. So um, one of the things that we're really proud of, and this is something that I was actively involved in, is I'm a, I'm a big data guy, I love, you know, 
Mm. Data to me is everything. And I like you, <laughs> you said, I came from sales and marketing and I understand the value of if you have if you have data, how to use it and transform your business. And we've made big investments with the marketing cloud. So even the smallest company doesn't need to go and get mm. you know, 50 mm -hmm. data scientists and and which are really hard to get. Like it's it's a really competitive market. But using those analytics to understand what's going on with your subscriber, how can you make them happier? Is there something you can do proactively? Are they going to churn? What are some indicators of that? So you give them a phone call and say, hey, Nathan, I see you're having some Wi-Fi problems and or you're hitting up against your barriers. Well, here's something I'm going to do for you to, to, mm -hmm. to keep, right? So I think that proactive mindset and really mining the data so you can understand that the customer is, is super important, really important. Yeah, for sure. For sure, because that you're right. I, I mean, our WIS, we have that local flair. And I think one thing you guys have done really well, and, and you mentioned it, like you have so many different things you're doing. How, how do you prioritize? And I think the right answer to that, at least on this show, is that you you prioritize what I ask for, right? That's what you guys do. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. that's right. but, but I, I think, you know, when you tell a customer, <clears throat> we're going to upgrade your network at some point, some point never is, is not tomorrow and some point is not good enough. But what you guys have done is you're like, hey, we do a release every quarter and right. your request is in this release because of lots of different reasons why we have to push right. it out. But at least I know, right? I know it's on the roadmap. I know it's important enough. And and knowing then says, okay, well, I will I will wait or, or no, that's that's a showstopper for me. Can we have another discussion about it? Or no, that that's okay. And I think that's something that a lot of WIS are scared to do, right? They're scared to tell their customers the truth about hey, this is where we are. Reality is I can't upgrade my whole network and I'm sorry, but here's the steps we're taking to make sure that you will get good service. It just may not be tomorrow. Uh, and they all want it yesterday, but we all want everything yesterday. Yeah, but, but like, so, well, and, I, and I think it comes down to also understanding your market dynamics, right? Because if you, if you have good data and insights into what's going on, if, if you know what their premise is and, and where they are and what their choices are also, right? Do they only have like crappy one megabit DSL so they really don't have a choice? Well, then you say, if you can go to them and say, hey, I'm genuinely gonna upgrade you, but it's gonna be 12 months from now. Well, then they'll just be happy that, hey, 12 months from now, that's great, because at least I know I have a future as opposed right. to sitting here stewing about the fact that- <laughs> I can't They don't care about me anymore. And, yeah, right, yeah. You, you've got right. my business. Um, I don't have any alternatives and I feel I feel left out. Right. And then and that that breeds resentment. Right. And mm -hmm. even if it's two years from now saying, look, yes, we're, we're making investments, but give me two years from now. Here's what we're doing. And, and I think the key thing is that you have to tailor that message to your point with regards to, you know, what's the competitive landscape and, and understanding the data. Right. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, you mentioned data and you mentioned one of your early bosses was just really big into data. What are some other, do you have a key lesson you learned working abroad, right? I, I, when I go back to South Africa, like it was amazing. We went back eight years ago. Every single corner had two or three video rental stores, like DVD rental stores. And I'm like, oh, they haven't heard of Netflix yet. So right. I, I may or may not have brought a router with a VPN on it and introduced my cousins and my 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 uncles and, and nephews and everything to to Netflix. And they're like, what? You can stream everything? And then you go back like one year later and or, or, or we go back a, a year ago, uh, just before the pandemic and not a single video store is in business, right? Because it all went Netflix and everything. What are some of those things that you saw being abroad that, that you like came back to the US and you're like, oh, or Canada and you're like, oh, they totally missed the boat, but this is something. Have you, do you have any kind of aha moments like I, that? I think it's, you know, so my biggest learning is when I was abroad, we're actually just about awareness of other people. Right. Mm, and I, okay. and I, think, I think that's the biggest thing is that um, there's so many different cultures. And, and I came back with this, you know, this uh, this deep understanding that that uh, of um, my perspectives are not the perspectives of the person across from me. They may have different values, all those different mm -hmm. things. And where, you know, I was kind of brought up very black and white. Actually, don't judge. Right. Listen, understand. Uh -huh. And and the best example I can give of that with regards to like learning as a leader was actually in Japan, where lying is not bad. In fact, in there's scenarios where lying is actually culturally what? from a value okay. point of view better yeah. than not lying. And the example is, is that is that in the Japanese culture that if you are 
with somebody and they want you to do something, the reason why, and you may have heard this, is that they always say yes, is because they don't want to offend. It's actually, if you're yeah, from a hard right. point of view, more senior than them, if they don't say yes, they just agree and then they don't go do it. So while it's not outright lie, they say yes, yes, and then they just don't go do it. And the reason why is because they, in their culture, actually creating that tension and animosity is actually from a values point of view, um, more important than, than telling the truth. And so huh. you think about that and, and from a, you know, from a North American, which is very, you know, Protestant based type of, you know, values, right? right? That's just an, that's an outright lie. So therefore it's, it's really hard. <laughs> and the irony is you, you, or the humorous thing about that was I, I would always see people coming from North America, whether it's U.S. or Canada, and they would come into Japan and I would just sit there and laugh because I'd watch <laughs> the Japanese and they're all going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I know they're not going to do it. And the, the, you know, the American leaders going, yeah, yeah, bang, bang, yeah, bang. Got it done. Like, good good yeah, meeting. Yeah, good yeah. meeting. We got everything done. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That was great. Look at, they just said, I'm like, no, no. And then, you know, and then I would stop the meeting and I would say, okay, stop being Japanese. Right. You know, tell them the truth. And they're like, Michael son, you can't do that. I'm like, tell them the truth. Right. You know, <laughs> and then, you know, and then they come out, but, but that for me, I think was the biggest thing is, is to really, really respect the differences in people, which makes it better because inside our companies, like we have so many backgrounds and, and, right. you know, and you see that even from state to state, right? Like when you go uh -huh. from one state to the next state, people in Florida are very different than people from Nebraska who are different from Michigan, who are different from California. And so, you know, to get the most out of teams, I think that's something that from a leadership point of view is really, really important. You know, and with regards to, you know, where we're going from technology and those different elements, um, I, I, you know, I, is one team, you know, one group's ahead of the other. Look, I think I think there's a reason why Silicon Valley um, continues to exist when if actually were just to take pure economies of scale, um, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, you would suggest you could say that, well, India or China should have wiped out a Silicon Valley, right? If you just do an economic, if you take an economics based model, right? Right. But, but the reason why that I think that Silicon Valley and, and it, it exists is because we allow that free thinking and that innovation mindset and that, you know, you can do anything, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you can be anything, you can be anyone. And I think in the end, that's, that's continues to be our biggest advantage is that, you know, there's, there's no, there's no barrier that we can't overcome as individuals in North America. And I think that's part of, that's what we're taught in our education system and in our values and all those things. And so I think that that, that continues to be one of our greatest, uh, our greatest advantages. And so when I went abroad and I look at some of the hierarchical cultures where, you know, you mm -hmm. must obey your boss, right? That's definitely, you know, Japan and Korea, right? For example, right. You know, the, there's I can tell you all these stereotypes that are true. One of them being if I was in the office, they would never leave until I left the office. Right. Which is just uh, so weird. Right. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so I'd be I'd be going. I'm like, I'm leaving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Um, but the concept of work from home would never existed there, too. So so I, I just I, I think I'm, I'm I left I left and I learned a lot about respecting cultures, but at the same time, I was very proud about, you know, North America, North America, Canada and the U S in that our, I'm, you know, we have a very innovative, we have very innovative cultures. And I think we need to continue to, to really ensure that we foster that respected and, and make sure it's happening. Yeah, no, I think that's so great. Cause you know, a lot of wisps, every wisp I've talked to, especially during the pandemic, we're all growing, right? I mean, like sure. we, we, we have more, almost double the amount of people that work for us, uh, that have worked here less than a year that have worked here more than a year. Right. And, and a right. lot of wisps were growing and, and it is a different, you bring in culture and culture is super important. And, and you saw culture on a global scale and, 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 but you mentioned on the state scale. And when you bring, I think even some of our areas, it's on a town scale, right? Yeah, right. So different sure. things. And you got to have those perspectives. That, that's great. Well, and we as leaders, I think we need to really foster that and allow diversity of thinking. Right. Because mm -hmm. that's really important because the value is, I think you mentioned you have over you've added what, 130 or 150 people or whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. think about all those different perspectives and all those different talents and those views. Mm -hmm. And and, you know, you may you and your team, if you've all been together, like when I first joined, the average tenure at Calix was 15 years. Wow. wow. Yeah. Like, wow. which, which kind of blew me away. I've never been anywhere that's other than Bell. That's yeah. Like, 
years, right? And so, and if you think about what we've done over the last five years, I think we've we've probably bought in, you know, probably fifty percent of the company's got to be below, you know, four years now, right? Because we right. Grew. And so, and what it's done is it's just brought all these different perspectives. And what's great is it, you know, the people who have been there for a long time, they add a lot of value because they know how the company's worked. Mm-hmm. We know our history, some of the things we did really well, some of our failures. Um, and and as long as they're willing to learn, then they've got all these new people who have new ideas and they can collaborate and, and then come up with a, this is how we used to do it versus this is how someone else has done it and then find the best ways forward, right? Right. Yeah. And that's always, you know, it's, it, that starts with the leadership, right? The leadership at the top, because man, if you don't have an open and like challenge everything mindset, then all you're going to get is yes, men. Yes. Bobble. Yes. Women. Yeah. Bobblehead. Yes. I don't want a bobblehead. Yes. Please don't do just what I ask you to do, you know, do what needs to be done and figure things out. So I have a philosophy that I share with everybody all the time who works in my, on, my, on the teams that I lead and I say, don't let me be wrong. And I heard it from this woman who taught me this years ago, which is, look, you know, and I say, look, please, if you think I'm wrong, tell me, right? Yes. And I said, yes. and I always say to him, I said, look, there's going to be a couple of outcomes here. First of all, I'm always going to thank you for, you know, sharing your, sharing what your view is, right? Yeah. Second of all, if you're right, I'm going to thank you for stopping me from driving <laughs> off. A hey, great. Right. Thanks for helping me understand that I'm actually wrong. But the other one is, is that, in times of change, if you share what you're thinking and why you think I'm wrong, and in fact, it's just because of the fact that you're in your part of the business, you don't see the overall business, and in fact, you're wrong, well, that helps me understand that actually, if chances are, if you don't understand what's going on in the company and you have this mis, you know, this, per- this perception, which is, is incorrect, there's other people in the team who also have that perspective. And therefore, you just you've. I'll thank you again because I'll say, well, you. I'll, I'll correct you and and help you understand why that's not necessarily the case. But then I'll really step back and think about the broader organization because, um, and we got a communication problem because if that person has that that view, maybe there's a bunch of other people who are also not understanding what we're doing as a company, and especially in times mm-hmm. of growth and change, that over communicating and making sure everybody understands not only what we're doing, but why we're doing it, it becomes really, really important. Otherwise, you know, you just find that people are, you know, kind of running off in different different routes and it, it gets confusing and, and not productive, right? Yeah, we found even the clearest message um, gets broken during the broken telephone phone game, right? I mean, it, it's just amazing. It's like, we all heard the same thing. Why do we not all understand the same? It's, well, we all have our own bias and we all bring for good and for bad. And you're right, you have to spend a lot of time on that. I uh, well, and one of the things I was, when I first came out of university, I worked, I, I mentored, uh, one of my mentors was this amazing salesperson and he had all kinds of great philosophies. But one of them that he had was, you know, perception is reality. Mm-hmm. And he said, he said, you really need to always be thinking about the other person's perception because, you know, just just because you think something is right, you know, obviously there's the world, there's, there's certain black and white whites about what's right and wrong, but right. there's, there's, there's a whole, obviously don't steal stuff like that, but there's all the other things that are, you know, what's right and wrong and, and people based upon how they were raised, what their values are, or even their mindset in the moment. Maybe they had a bad day, right? You know, they're, you know, they had a, um, their kids sick or whatever it is, understanding their perspectives and what the reality is in the moment becomes really important to help people um, stay aligned. Yeah, that's that's really good. Another one I heard that I think would go right along with that is we judge ourselves or we judge others on their actions and we judge ourselves on our intentions. Intent. Yeah, right. right. You know, and it's like, wait a minute, when you really think about that, you're like, no, I don't. It's like, oh, um, yes, you do. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> but I had the best of intentions. He right. Was, I, I was, was altruistic. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, so so let's wrap up the, the the conversation today. I think it's been great. Um, go back to your younger self, yeah. right? Everything you know today, now you know. Go back to your younger self and say, "Gee, I, I wish I would have known this when I was younger." What, what's your kind of your advice to yourself? Um, well, so do something that I did do and continue to you know even pursue it more aggressively is read everything. Mm, That's the first okay. thing, right? So you know. Um, I'm a bit older and 
when I was younger, it was, you know, it was harder. It was expensive to buy a book. You didn't have audible. So I didn't have audio around yeah. yeah, all that kind of stuff. Right. Like I envy the, the, the people who are growing up today because the amount of knowledge that they have at their fingertips is just incredible. And right. so, you know, I would, I would just reinforce that, that if I was to go back, you know, make sure I read everything that I can, because it's the fastest way to become really great at whatever you choose to be. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and then the second one is, look, it's going to, it's going to hurt. Because, <laughs> 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 it's right. gonna hurt, you know. And, and so, hang in there, buddy, because you're gonna go and. And the reason why is because it, you know, if if you're not in the hurt, if you're actually not yep. skinning your knees, banging your elbows, making yep. mistakes, you're not taking risks, right? Right. And so you you got to go and take those big risks. And I'm fortunate to you know have be married to somebody who we shared the same value, you know, the same goals, and we uh -huh. took some big risks together and stuff like that. But it hurt, right? Yeah. And um, and so you know, just recognize that you're in for a world of pain if you're going to take those risks. Otherwise, look, you can you can do the safe route. But let's face it, what what owner or business leader of a wisp is actually taking a safe route? No, they're not. They're not no. going to go and become a um, you know, they didn't choose to become a government, you know, a municipal employee or, you know, right. something like that. They decided to start a business. And when you do that, you, you know, you've got risks. And so, yeah. uh, and, and then the last is like nothing and nothing worthwhile is easy. So right. no. hang in there. Right. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Cause I just, in fact, I was just talking to my kids that they're all three of them are swimmers and they were talking about how hard practice was. I'm like, yeah, if, if, if swimming was easy, everybody would do it, but not everybody does it. And, and it's like, oh, I know, dad, but I'm like, wait a minute, but life, like, look at the people who sit back and just go with the flow and don't achieve anything. And those that push really hard and say, I'm responsible for what happens in my life and I'm going to go do the best I can. It won't be always easy and it won't be perfect, but I'm going to do it. And I think that's great advice um, that, that, you know, tell your former self or your younger self, it's okay. It's going to be hard, but it's worth it. Well, and I mean, the last one, I just say, listen to my wife more because she's actually really smart. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I, I, I wear the pants in the family. Oh, she yeah. She just right. tells me which ones to put on. So, you know, I, I learned that early on in my marriage and good marriage. <laughs> exactly. My wife is very smart. And, and again, I, I owe her everything because, you know, I look back on it and, and think about that international. I never would have never would have thought to do it. I would have just kind of like next job and kind of yeah. plugged on and all that kind of stuff. And and thankfully, by taking those risks, you know, mm -hmm. learned a lot, stretched myself. You know, it was definitely painful. There's no doubt. Like, um, but it was a great experience. So, yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on with us. I think it's uh, great to always learn about people who are those couple steps ahead of us and have got a lot of world experiences. I think that's uh, great. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, and I would say anybody who's uh, watching this, if you want to send me a LinkedIn, if there's any way I can help, I love helping fellow business leaders. And um, uh, if you have any questions for me, I've, I've done a lot of sales transformations and business transformations. And yeah. so if someone needs some help, I'm glad to, to assist if I can. Well, that's that's great. And thank everybody for watching. Thank you for watching. You can check us out here on Facebook or on our YouTube uh, channel that we have. And uh, we love to, to see what we can do to help. Somebody will watch this video one day and be like, oh, that was exactly what I needed. So I, I think it's perfect. But thanks so much for tuning in today. See, bye to everybody. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you.